gentlemen, how are we doing? What a crowd. It's great to see you all with us this afternoon to focus on this key topic, unleashing the potential of women entrepreneurs. My name is Julie Gishuru. It's an honor to guide this session this afternoon. You're going to have a great panel, and you have three Ignite speakers who will be speaking to you. I look forward to that. Um, but first, um, let me set some context. A short while ago, a man called Eliud Kipchoge, how many know that name? From Kenya, proved to us that the impossible is indeed possible. He runs sub two for the marathon. Why do I mention that? It's because we have a real challenge ahead of us, an intense challenge. But anything is possible. As we go into conversations, as we prepare for the discussions that are coming up. Let me root this in reality. We're saying we need to unleash the potential of women entrepreneurs. I want to challenge that a little bit and say, women entrepreneurs all over the world are unleashing their own potential. In the hardest of circumstances, they're running businesses and getting by. In some very fragile situations, women are keeping their families together, feeding their children and sending them to get the best kind of education they can possibly afford for them. They are managing their homes and they are managing their communities. They are planning, they are surviving against all odds. So the question is, how can we play a role and unleash the potential we have to significantly transform their situations because they're already doing incredible things. And so today we're talking about how we do this through access to finance, through markets. I'm very excited about the speakers today and the panel coming up, but first and foremost, I have asked World Bank Group President David Malpass to make some remarks. So let's give him a warm round of applause, please, as he comes up to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, okay, good. I may stand up here. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon and uh, very warm welcome. Is this... Um, we're, we're here today to discuss how to create more opportunities for women entrepreneurs, allowing women to participate fully in society and the economy is a global imperative, one that the World Bank is working on every day. We're fortunate to be joined by three distinguished panelists who will share their insights and perspectives. We'll be sitting up here uh, in, in a couple of minutes. We'll also hear first from inspiring entrepreneurs who are working to take their venture to the next level. Um, so b before we get to that, I'd like to share a little bit of the World Bank's perspective on this. Uh, starting a growing business is one of the most powerful tools for women to overcome poverty. Yet in most countries, women face legal, financial, and cultural barriers that stifle entrepreneurial success. Women entrepreneurs struggle to have access to capital. They struggle to have access to goods uh, and services. Uh, they, they face legal obstacles, and the World Bank works through the Women, Business, and the Law Report to find the average economy, that the average economy gives women only three quarters of the legal rights of men. We need better laws and regulatory reforms. Uh, that becomes a very important piece of the puzzle, and it's a core part of the World Bank's work in, uh, uh, in developing countries. A few years ago, the World Bank Group piloted a project in Cote d'Ivoire that led to a series of reforms that resulted in a revised family code uh, that ensures that husbands and wives will have more equal say to manage household assets. Barriers to entry is a very real problem facing women and the poor uh, 
and and the uh, one of the hopeful signs going on in development is the lowering of transaction costs, which gives more access then to uh, to people that uh, that are entering uh, the market, including new women entrepreneurs. Um, the, I'd like to highlight two key partnerships that we'll hear more about today. The first is the Women Entrepreneurs Opportunity Facility, WEOF. Uh, five years ago, IFC, the International Finance Corporation, which is part of the World Bank Group, and Goldman Sachs created this facility, building on the success of Goldman's 10,000 Women Initiative and the IFC's Banking on Women program. That effort is bearing fruit IFC's investments through WEOF in developing country financial institutions are strengthening businesses and creating jobs in challenging markets around the world. And I'm pleased to tell you that one of our speakers today from Kenya is a graduate of Goldman's 10,000 Women Initiative and is a client of, uh, of a WEOF partner bank. Um, the second initiative that I want to uh, mention uh, is the Women Entrepreneurs Finance Initiative, WeFi, which is based at the World Bank. Uh, it takes a broad ecosystems approach, including access to markets, networks, technology, and tackling laws and business practices that keep women from thriving in business. WeFi is a partnership between 14 governments, including the United States, which delivered the first important commitment. These governments contributed over $350 million. WeFi works with six multilateral development banks, the World Bank Group being one, uh, as well as working with the private sector, civil society, and other stakeholders. WeFi is the first fund that addresses the systemic barriers to women entrepreneurs in developing countries by linking policy, legal, and regulatory reforms with public and private investor investments. And over two financing rounds, nearly $250 million has been allocated to implementing partners uh, related to WeFi. The program aims to help 115,000 women-owned small and medium-sized enterprises. Um, so entrepreneurs make enormous sacrifices in pursuing their dreams, turning their ideas into scalable ventures, and taking them to the next growth stage. For women in developing countries, the challenge is even greater. We also know that women entrepreneurs have a major impact on their communities, not only in socioeconomic terms, but also as change agents and sources of inspiration. Success begets success. So I'm very happy to give the floor to three inspiring women who will share with you their journey of entrepreneurship. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, David. You may take your seat. And for those of you who are not aware, um, this really is an important agenda for the World Bank. I think the Partnership Forum started earlier this week with a focus on empowering women. And I just want to congratulate the World Bank and partners who are taking this seriously in terms of economic uh, growth and transformation. It is absolutely critical that we focus on women empowerment. Time, ladies and gentlemen, for me to introduce introduce our Ignite speakers and to welcome them up to take the stage. Maheen Adamji is the founder of Dot and Line in Pakistan. Do come up, Maheen, please. A tech-enabled education startup in maths and tutoring. In maths tutoring, an investee of an IFC WeFi supported VC fund. Let's give her a round of applause, please. Thank you. Shiro Waweru Waithaka is the co-founder and CEO of Fun Kids Kenya, a furniture manufacturing business, part of Goldman's 10,000 Women Initiative, as mentioned earlier by David. Round of applause, please, for Shiro. And Dina El Shanufi is the Chief Investment Officer of Flat Six Labs, a VC funded accelerator, an IFC and WeFi investee, working across the MENA region, investing with a gender lens. A round of applause for her, please. 
Ladies, I hand over to you. I believe we start with Maheen. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Maheen Adamji, and I'm a co-founder of Dot and Line in Pakistan. To understand who I am and what we do, you have to know where I come from. I come from a long line of entrepreneurs. Both my grandfathers contributed to the industrial and economic growth of my country. Yet, when my mother, a young 17-year-old, was married, she didn't get the same opportunities, and her ambition was restricted to the home. On the day of the birth of my twin sister and I, sorry, on the day of my birth and my twin sister and my birth, my mother decided things would be different for us. She raised four strong-willed girls, each with a conviction that just one generation ago would be considered unacceptable. I went on to, to attend university in the UK, graduated from the London School of Economics, and pursued journalism. I even won an award highlighting education in one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in Karachi. I thought I had found my calling, but everything changed with the birth of my daughter. For my daughter, I wanted the best education, but I struggled to find one that checked all the boxes. And I wasn't alone in that struggle. There are 28 million school-going children in Pakistan. And after spending seven years in school, more than half of them cannot read at the second grade level. The, their numeracy skills are also at the second grade level. The system is broken. With that in mind, my partner and friend, Lena and I, quit our jobs and converted my parents' garage into an experimental learning lab. We had a vision. We wanted to spark curiosity in children. We wanted to take information from textbooks and connect them with the wider world. We wanted to bring world-class learning to our doorstep. Our workshops took flight, and with that, our message to the Pakistani parent reimagining education. But beyond the small groups of early adopters, many still found us too far or simply unaffordable. That is when Dot and Line was born. Dot and Line builds scalable learning environments with specially built programs. These programs in English and math are written by some of the brightest minds in our country. With the help of Spring Accelerator, we gained access to a panel of experts with funding from DFED and then with seed investment from a VFI-backed VC investor, we were able to take an idea and form a fully functioning organization. That, by the way, is my partner uh, attending the conference at Spring. But more importantly, are all the women who are our teachers. These women are fighting their own societal battles, going through a rigorous recruitment vetting and a training process, they're able to set up a dot and line center in the comfort of their home, becoming micro-entrepreneurs and teachers in their communities. These women are software engineers, bankers, doctors, but they're also mothers, wives, and caretakers. Their struggle resonated with me. As a mother of two, I was once advised when I was on a trip to raise funding not to bring up my then three-month-old. They said it would deter early investors. But my friend and partner pushed me to bring my whole self to the table. And that sentiment became the mantra of Dot and Line. A beautiful community of women emerged who not only encourage one another to own their narrative, but rise to find meaning and purpose in their lives. Today, Dot and Line runs over 200 centers in three of the largest cities in Pakistan. We boost student learning outcomes in just four short months. 
Our vision is to grow to 10,000 centers in four years and then take our learning modules online so that even those in small towns can learn and grow with the rest of us. The struggles have been many. In a cash-based economy and in the absence of a fintech solution, it's difficult to scale a business such as this. Couple that with the reluctance of investors to enter a market with seemingly volatile macroeconomic conditions. But then there is our dream. With a population in Pakistan of mostly under 25 years, at dot in line we believe the next great scientist or inventor, the next great artist or leader is living amongst us. It is our responsibility to give them the tools by which they can fulfill their full potential. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Shiro Wawero Waidaka from Kenya, and I've not run a marathon yet, but that's okay. <laughs> I am the CEO and founder of a company called Fun Kids. My earliest memory being a creative and having resilience is from the age of nine. That's me. I grew up on a farm. My parents, very clear about the need to work hard and would be kicked out of the house by four or five in the morning and come back when the duties, not chores, but duties are done. In my free time, I would create, I would dream, I would make crafts, and I would win competitions. I would win competitions. I absolutely love creativity. A few years after being nine, I'm sort of like 12 maybe, Okay, I lie, I'm older. I still create, I still color, I still paint. I was born to create. After high school in Kenya, I was fortunate to go and study interior architecture at the Glasgow School of Art. I worked extremely hard, graduated in interior architecture, and then went back home and founded a very successful business called Amber Africa. That wasn't enough. While expecting our firstborn son, Kihara, and soon after his, daughter, his sister, Nyokabi, I started looking around for things for them, beds, clothes, books, and I was disappointed. None of them were made in Kenya. None of them reflected my children or reflected me. We are the fastest growing continent, largest number of children and youth. How do we not have a brand for children from Kenya and for the world? I decided to do something about it. With the birth of our children, Brand Fun Kids was born. Brand Fun Kids was born to change the narrative. Children deserve better. Children deserve to be children. Children like color. They like pushing boundaries. But this is not always the case. Majority of the schools in Kenya, parents have to buy their own furniture, many of whom can't afford it. This good people is a real picture of the situation. If they're lucky, they sit on a stone, bare earth, and sometimes in water. It is beyond heartbreaking. There needs to be another word for it. This is not okay. We must change this. Brand Fun Kids from Kenya is changing this. These are some of the products we make. As we scaled our business, we were struggling. But that's what entrepreneurs in developing markets do. We're resilient. After the launch of our brand, Fun Kids, the furniture, we decided to start an educational program for children like me, like you, like your kids called Kids Go Tech, where we teach children how to innovate, how to work machines, robots, from basic principles. This is our STEAM project. We call it STEAM and not STEM because we add the A for the arts. This so far has had an impact on 1,500 children and youth in Kenya. 
we have been bootstrapping. Five years into the business, we went asking for money. Banks wouldn't give us money. Not because our business wasn't viable. We're the fastest growing continent, largest number of children and youth, almost a no-brainer business. But because as a woman, they did not believe that could manufacture or even understand machines, that I had a dream and a vision to be one of the largest children's brands in the world. They did not believe me. This became a struggle. But thanks to wealth, women, economic opportunities, facility by Goldman Sachs and the IFC. We got a loan. I was able to scale. I bought state-of-the-art equipment. Thank you again. We are now able to compete globally. This has been my joy. 2018, the government of Kenya issued a ban on logging. That meant my primary raw material did not exist. This is fantastic for the environment. We really need to protect it, not only in Kenya, but I think around the world. This month, we've started the largest tree planting campaign as a country, and I 100% applaud our government. However, this hit me. This hit our business. Again, our resilience. We got up, and we are now using a circular economy model that is sustainable. We're using waste from big companies like yours, shipping pallets, broken furniture, and converting it all into dignified furniture for children because they deserve better. We didn't stop there. Women smallholder farmers can't afford to cut away their waste. We are now collecting it from the farms, compacting it, and for the first time in Kenya, with assistance of the Ministry of Environment, we have made the first sustainable building boards using agricultural waste. I can breathe again. The cloud and fogs from my eyes have lifted. I have a smile. I'm about to do my 159. Run Fun Kids is scaling. I now understand how diamonds are formed under immense pressure. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dina Shanufi, and I'm the Chief Investment Officer at Flat6 Labs. As I stand here, I could still hear my mother say, well, of course, you're your father's daughter, often with an eye roll. Guilty as charged, in every way, my father, may his soul rest in peace, is my role model. He built himself from very humble beginnings to become one of Egypt's leading gynecologists. He never tired of wanting and achieving more. But most importantly for me, he was just the best father a girl can ask for. In a society which, well, maybe just chooses to burden females way less than men, my father disagreed. He treated me exactly as he did my elder brother. Same expectations, career aspirations, and even demands. However, it was my mother, a doctor herself, juggling an academic career and a private practice, all while being a beautiful mother, wife, and daughter, that showed me how to do it. But I had a different calling than theirs. From a very young age, I just fell in love with numbers. So I pursued a career in asset management, and I I thought I hit the jackpot, numbers day in, day out, minimal human interactions, and progressing very fast. Um, and I absolutely hated it. I made what seemed like paper returns for entities I never met in institutions I only related to through Bloomberg. Something else nagged at me. We launched Flat6 Labs in December, uh, in October 2011 in Cairo, and it quickly grew to five more countries, covering Cairo, 
uh, covering Saudi, UAE, Bahrain, Tunisia, uh, Lebanon, and soon others. Over the past eight years, we've invested in over 230 companies as their institutional co-founders. We have supported more than 1,000 entrepreneurs and helped create more than 2,300 high-impact jobs, all while creating returns of 20%. Flatsix Labs was created out of both a need and an opportunity exactly like the startups we invest alongside in. A grassroots movement of talented young entrepreneurs with exceptional tech talents. They're all globally connected and surrounded by an abundance of opportunities. They needed the funding, but to really succeed, they needed our accelerator program. The mentorship, the, the industry experts, the showcasing, and a lot of hand-holding. They also all simply just needed someone to believe in them. Those needs are the same across the region. Perhaps our biggest validation came in December 2016, when the IFC invested in our Egypt fund as our lead and anchor investor. It was IFC's first such investment globally. To only confirm their conviction, both the IFC and the WeFi just recently invested alongside us again in Tunisia to promote bright females. Perhaps there's no bigger opportunity as that as supporting bright females. Today, in my part of the world, less than 10% of startups are launched by female founders. Our future generations would basically the economies would basically double once we fix that disparity. At, FEMA, at Flat Six Labs, we've launched female founder workshops where we showcase successful females to an all-female audience. And you immediately see a light bulb switch on because they suddenly realize that they too can. Flat Six Labs is a pure return-centric organization. However, invariably, we have a much bigger impact because day in, day out, we'll he we're help creating companies that improve lives one way or the other. Just like Dua, the founder of Shafet does, Dua was a young cancer patient. She, she struggled to find her medication. She decides to create a solution for herself and others. So she builds an app that connects all chronic disease patients with pharmacies to get their medication delivered to their store steps. In under 18 months, Dua has created a network of over 800 pharmacies spread all over Egypt and fulfilling more than 5,000 orders on a weekly basis and growing exponentially. This by no means is an easy feat in Egypt. And there are many more success stories just like that. It took Flat Six Labs five years to create its first 50 investments. Today, we do more than 50 a year. But we still need more, a lot more. Because after all, I'm still my father's daughter. Thank you. Wow, wow, wow. Another round of applause, please. Thank you very much, ladies. Very inspiring stories. You may take your seats at the front. And, you know, Shiro says to us, I've run my 159. I've run it. But, you know, running 159 is not about the individual, it's about the team. It's about the trainers and the pacemakers and the supporters cheering somebody on. And I think that's where our panel session takes us. Who are the critical stakeholders and partners? What is their role in supporting us to achieve the impossible? Let me welcome the panel to come back up. Uh, David, please do come back up and, and you will have a seat right here on the front seat. I want to welcome Ivanka Trump, advisor to the US president, to come up and take a seat. You can give her a round of applause. Go ahead. David Solomon of Goldman Sachs, please do come up and take a seat as well right next to Ivanka. 
and Anna Botin from Santander. Thank you. And David, over to you. Thank you very much. And maybe one more round of applause for our, the presenters. Thank you very much. That was, that was inspiring. Um, well, all three of you have been so very involved in these efforts, uh, and people value it. It's working, and we see a big change. So I'm, I'm, my job is to moderate uh, you, but mostly I want to listen to all of you on what's worked, where do you want to go, where do you see opportunities for the initiative. So if I may, may I start with Ivanka and come this way. Um, what, how, how did you get involved in WeFi in the beginning, uh, and uh, where do you see it go? Where would you like to see it go, and what inspired you from these presentations? Thank you, David, and thank you to all of your colleagues here at the World Bank for the exceptional work that's being done on a broader range of, of issues, but specifically what we're talking about right now, which is women's economic empowerment. So David asked me a question that he very much knows the answer to. It was the earliest days of the Trump administration, and I was talking with David's predecessor about the gap that existed for women entrepreneurs in the developing world. There had been a pretty robust ecosystem of microfinance that had developed over the decade prior. But for women who had started a business, created a business, and had shown proof of concept, there was very little capital for them to scale and grow. So how could we create a vehicle that could address the needs of small and medium-sized businesses and their access to capital, their access to markets and mentorship and networks? This is where I call David Melpass. <laughs> and we started having a conversation in his role then at, at Treasury around what that would look like and how we could structure it. And and WeFi was born. So we are very excited to hear from two of WeFi's recipients. Um, their incredible stories of what can happen when women are given the opportunity to realize their dreams and their potentials. And we know that access to capital is far harder for women than men. In 70% of the developed, developing world, women face inadequate access to capital and really an inability to access institutions altogether. So WeFi has aimed to really solve for this problem and alongside at its launch 14 other countries. It was launched and two years later it is in 29 countries. $2.6 billion has been mobilized for entrepreneurs such as yourself, and we are really proud of its work. And it is a critical pillar of an initiative I'll tell you about after my friends have had the opportunity to speak, but our WGDP initiative, in which the second pillar relates to promoting women entrepreneur success in the developing world with a specific focus on access to capital. So WeFi is one of the great success stories of WGDP. S super, that's great. So what we'll, we'll create a foundation of where we are now and then the second, second round will go to where you want to go, uh, wh where, where we can go with uh, these kinds of activities. David, I know uh, Goldman Sachs has been very involved in 10,000 women and uh, has, has created a platform. How'd that come about and wh uh, what are you happy with? What it, would you like to see done with it? Sure, thank you. I'm really, um, I'm really very pleased to be here and uh, to spend a couple of minutes, both with Ivanka and Anna, talking about this topic. It's such an important topic. And Goldman Sachs' interest in this topic really goes back to research that, that we did 20 years ago. There was a female partner of the firm, a woman named Kathy Mitsui, who wrote a research report in 1999 called Womenomics that really identified in Japan, just in that society, that there was so much economic potential if we could unleash the power of women. And over the course of the decade that followed, there were other research reports really looking at opportunities, both in the more developed world and the developing world, to unleash the power of women to drive more economic growth. Seeing that, and particularly taking an interest 
in the emerging economies we established uh, in 2008 the 10,000 Women Program with a goal at first to provide education, business education, that helped women that were running SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises in these developing economies, to expand their businesses. And the program met with enormous success. 70% uh, of those businesses saw immediate growth in revenues, the immediate addition of employees, and additional hiring. And so, you know, with that, we really went to reach that goal, and in five years, we were able to get 10,000 women through that program. But then, to the point of next step in listening to them, the next question was access to capital. And we can come back to that, but that, that really was the base of the program and how it got started. That's super. One, one of the hard parts for uh, women in uh, developing countries is that first step because uh, the, the uh, barriers to entry are high in terms of the bank doesn't lend to women or the bank doesn't lend to new businesses. So that's, that's uh, in part why there need to be these bridges. A Anna Botin, you work in this uh, every, every day. What, can you share insights? What, what countries have really been able to move forward? How do they do it and how do you help? So it's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I, just a, a few minutes because I was listening uh, to the entrepreneurs and you know, we all have fathers and um, Santander has been around for 160 years. I was working at Santander with my father and one day he said, he asked me to leave the bank, not very politely. Um, and so I set up my own business. I was 38, I was me in Spain, and it was hard. So I was there for three years, and then one day my father calls me and says, come back to run Banesto, which was a Spanish bank. And I learned what it was to be a small business run by a woman at the other side of the table. I understood the enormous power for good if we did things right that banks could have. So he asked me to decide in like two seconds because otherwise I would have not gone back and I would have stayed with my company. But I realized that being at Santander, we have 140 million customers. I learned today at another panel that's double JP Morgan. My customers are, my customers are a bit poorer than JP Morgan's, but they're getting richer. <laughs> and so this is important because I learned what it was to be on the other side of the table. I was Spanish, I was not in a developing country, and I was not just, I'm sorry to say this, not any woman, and it was hard. So I was determined when I came back to do something about it. And so, I mean, what's relevant here is our microfinance program. Um, over the years, we've helped about a million people, of which 70% roughly a woman. We've dispersed 1.7 billion in, in loans, about 500, um, and it works. And, and there's many things that are specific to women. You know, women sometimes don't dare to go into our offices, so we've designed special offices. Um, you know, everything happens on the mobile. So we're now combining mobile with actual people from the communities that help the women and the entrepreneurs do the business. We can now approve a loan in 10 minutes on the mobile, uh, so there's all sorts of things that we've learned about how to make it easier for women, but actually we don't say no to the men, by the way, so we're not against the men. We just need an extra help for the woman. F fabulous. And before we come go, go, go on, I want to take note of Stephanie von Friedberg. Uh, she's the chief operating officer of IFC, which was very involved in these, uh, in some of these businesses, and grows and 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 tries to help partner and expand finance. One type of businesses, financial services businesses that are so important. Ivanka, sorry, you, but I forgot uh, then to yeah. say that the IFC is a wonderful partner. Mine was a leading question, that's what we call it. So uh, if I could lead uh, Ivanka, WGDP, so is that the next round and what will it do uh, to expand the effort? Thank you, David. Well, we had launched under this administration a series of important initiatives, WeFi being the first. 
um, but followed up with an initiative around access to finance at OPIC called 2X, which not only did we take up thinking about our development assistance through a gender lens, but we encouraged the other G7 countries to do so as well in, in Canada um, last year. So we launched a series of initiatives, those are just two, and realized we wanted to step back and think holistically about how we could create in the United States government the first all of government approach to women's economic empowerment in the developing world. We set an ambitious target, one in which I have no doubt that we will meet, of empowering 50 million women by 2025 through three specific pillars. The first is vocational education and job training. And that's not purely teaming up with the private sector and skilling people for jobs that those private sector actors are willing to create in the economy. That's one f component of it, and, and we rely very heavily on the private sector to create that job opportunity. The other component is taking the existing work women are doing and bringing technology and productivity techniques to bear to make their work more efficient to enable them to access markets. So sometimes it's the same work that they've been doing for 100 years, but we can help them achieve greater success through productivity gains. So that's pillar one. Pillar two relates to access to capital for women entrepreneurs. We all know about the gender credit gap that exists all over the world. And so with this pillar, we're seeking to bridge that and number three, which you touched on, David, in your opening remarks, is foundational to the sustained success of pillar one and two. And that is ensuring a legal environment that's conducive to women's economic empowerment. So there are many laws and areas that affect this mission. But you have to make a choice. You can go a mile wide and an inch deep, or you can define parameters and set very specific metrics against which to deliver, and we chose the latter. So we are starting out with five laws that we are seeking to have changed around the world. The first is the ability to travel freely. This isn't just driving, it's the ability to get a visa, a passport, um, travel papers generally. Critically important to be able to realize one's success in the economy and as an entrepreneur. The next is equal property rights for women. In 75 countries, 40% of the world roughly, women have at least one law restricting their ability to own, inherit, or manage property. This must change. The next is equal access to job opportunities. So in 104 markets, 2.7 billion women are prevented on working in the same industries or jobs as men for a variety of reasons. The set, the Fourth is access to credit, equal access under the law to credit. And the fifth is equal access to inst institutions. So this is courts of law, for example, which is, is so foundational. So we're really taking a look at these five laws and seeing how we can leverage the full diplomatic weight um, the ability to convene of the U.S. government with partners such as the World Bank um, and the terrific work that your team here does on the Women Business and the Law Report, the Doing Business Report, um, and so many other stakeholders to break down these very real legal cultural barriers. In some cases, the laws are fine, but when you go into the rural communities, they're not being implemented, and people are unaware of their rights. So we're very, very focused on this third pillar to ensure the success of the first two. Thanks. Um, yeah, we're working hard on it, and uh, as, as, I, as we uh, explain it in countries and try to get 
buy-in from countries and get them really engaged. One of the things that comes out is the economic value of all of this. Everyone understands when you say it that women are half the population and often producing more than half of the output and yet often are simply not being counted. Uh, they they, they uh, stay in the informal sector so they're maybe not paying even the low rate of taxes that ought to be on, uh, uh, on, on, on starting businesses. And so that's uh, uh, powerful. And then it also is inspirational within the society itself. Absolutely. And of the range, it's estimated that if women were able to participate in global markets equally to men, that would amount to $12 trillion annually. So it's a huge, huge number. And, uh, and we're very, people should be motivated by that. But it's not just an economic issue. That certainly motivates people. It's a social justice issue, of course. It's also a security issue. Um, and we in the United States think about our development assistance through the lens of achieving the goal for countries of self-reliance. And you cannot achieve self-reliance and the ability of a country to become a trading partner if you're not fully realizing the potential of 50% of your population and, in fact, have barriers against them to realizing that potential. That's a, that was a big number you gave even for Goldman Sachs. Uh, <laughs> so, um, D David, what, are, there, are there things that strike you that have that are happening now? Is it changing? Do you feel it in, you hire lots of people, you uh, uh, mentor and lead uh, a big organization. What's changing for the better? Uh, and in developing countries especially, what do you think? Well, there's, 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 there's a lot that's changing, but there's still a lot to do. I, I have to take a moment to mention our partnership with the IFC um, around our women's entrepreneurs uh, opportunity uh, facility and just following on what I had said about 10,000 uh, 10, women and the progress that we made in 2013 listening to the women who had been through the program of course this need because of the gender gap made it clear that what what can Goldman Sachs do we can try to be a facilitator as a private enterprise to work and partner and get more capital into these markets more lending more credit and so this facility was established uh, we now have five years of data. We spend a lot of time looking at that data and trying to analyze how it can be most effective. Over a billion and a half dollars has been deployed. Um, and you can really see how it's making an impact on closing that gap. But the gap's enormous, as Ivanka points out, and there's still a lot of work to be done. In terms of you know, your question and running a global organization like Goldman Sachs today, and I've, I've really tried in the little over a year that I've been the CEO of the organization to make diversity and inclusion one of the pillars of the organization and trying to move it forward. And I, I think about Goldman Sachs, what Goldman Sachs tries to do around the world with its footprint, and there's nothing more important than our having the highest quality people around the world to try to work and help advance these problems. There is no way we can attract people to our organization unless it is truly diverse, truly open, truly inclusive. We've made a bunch of progress, but we have a lot of progress to make. And I, I think in the developed world, the need to make this critical, it's been too long, we haven't gone far enough, the need to make it critical and for leaders to stand up and take ownership and advance it is just a necessity. And uh, there's a lot of work to do, candidly, and I'm, I'm personally not satisfied. Yeah, th th Right, um, and one, one of the things we work a lot on is data because in order to understand what the problem is, you need uh, some data and uh, one of the things that comes out of the data is the importance of girls, of uh, that the starting point comes early. We just yesterday uh, uh, issued uh, a report and an index on learning, uh, that l learning poverty and what we find is that a lot of kids, meaning 50%, 60% in some developing countries by age 10 still can't read a simple story. So that allows the country to focus because if it's a girl, it's going to be very hard for her as, uh, as she goes forward. So we've got a lot more data. They did a lot of work in order to come up with that data and I think it's going to be helpful. And Ivanka mentioned the Women Business and the Law Report, which uh, is, a, is a World Bank flagship report 
report that uh, that really goes into what laws in the countries need to be changed in order to make uh, in order to make progress. Anna, you've um, I I wonder if you could tell us. Uh, how you help uh, women in your organization and this idea of uh, can it be taught, can you mentor, can, how, do you bring, how do you help people come up through the ranks the way these ladies did? Well, first I have to say we have a lot to do. Uh, we're actually very proud that the 12 people from Santander that are here today, I think nine oh. are women, so that's progress. Um, and, and it's important. It's important that you know we do have women not just at at the lower level, of course, like everybody, but that they can go up in the ranks. And it's not. I mean, developing and developed world, not, something is not working. I mean, I give you two examples. I was at a meeting in Paris, 100 people, financial organizations globally, 100, 100 people, CEOs. How many women do you think there were, including me? Three. Oh. I was in the Nordics. We have a business in the Nordics. We're the biggest consumer lender in the Nordics. And I always meet with our women leaders. And we always have this idea that the Nordic countries, and by the way, they are ahead of many others, same picture as everywhere else. 20% of the senior executives, women, 20. And talking to these women is the same. And I think a lot has to do with culture. So education from the very, very beginning is super important, you know, from giving girls and boys do dolls and cars and all the way up. Um, mentoring is incredibly important. Every single study that I've seen, by the way, this works in developing, developed. Sometimes I get told that the Latino, I'm from Spain, the Latino countries, the men are more sort of macho, no? It's not true, they're the same everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you why. Because in every single organization, every country, and this is McKinsey and others, whenever there's a meritocracy, which most companies are, and you put forward job postings, and you see who puts themselves forward, men, sorry David, tend to be 50, 60% qualified. And that's good. They think they're better, they put themselves forward. Women, unless they're 100% qualified, will not say, I opt for the job. And so, you know, we do need to do more, and that's my message. Uh, we do need to give confidence. So I always say the best thing we can do to help women in jobs, entrepreneurs, in government, is give them confidence. Because, I mean, I shouldn't say this because I'm a woman, but we're much better than what we think in general. And we should be much more confident and speak up. And so what we're trying at Santander is, is mentoring, for example, that is super important. So all the way from the board, by the way, we have 40% women in our board, but that's relatively easier. I mean, the hard thing is I'm not, you know, we have committed to go to 30% women leaders at Santander. And we want to do this right for the men too. And so going from 20, which is where we are, to 30, that's a 50% increase. So that's tough. So you know, I think mentoring is very important and, and all these other things, but especially give confidence. So from very young all the way up, you know, we believe more in ourselves. That's really powerful. You know, we have a lot of data on education, and we find that uh, given the same uh, starting point, girls are always doing better than boys uh, at whichever age. Uh, but and so then, giving confidence is one of the most important steps. They so the, uh, so we we can. I don't know if David will, but I'll concede smarter and better uh, uh, to the <laughs> uh, Anna. What, so speak, I have so I have three yeah, uh -huh. boys, men. Uh, three men and one day one of them comes home from school and tells me I'm the best in my class and then he says of the boys of the boys <laughs> Uh, Anna, I'll can train. I st stay with you for a minute? You've done an incredible amount of work on digital uh, empowerment, and and I, I think it's very important for poor and for uh, new entrants into businesses uh, to be digital because it breaks down the transaction cost. Can you spend a minute for us on that? So, I, you know, I believe very uh, intensely in the combination of digital with real people. 
And I want to tell you a story. I mean, uh, as part of a microfinance, when I traveled to Latin America, I tried to not just visit the big corporates, but also the small entrepreneurs. And so just an example, in Brazil, in one of the um, areas, uh, there's a favela called Paraisopolis. There was a woman called Sandra I visited with a couple of years ago. She had been abandoned by her husband, left her in Brazil with $50,000 in debt. She was, no algorithm would have approved this woman at all. And our agent was able to give her a small loan. She eventually built a business, employs a few people. So I think digital is super, super important. It really makes your impact much, much bigger. So as an example, I was saying before, over 12 years, we've helped one million entrepreneurs, mostly in Latin America. Over the next five years, we aim to empower 10 million people. Again, about 70% of these will be women, and we have specific programs and networks that help women. But, and this is because we're putting more focus, we're putting more investment, but also because of digital. So digital does help you have a much bigger effect. And by the way, collaboration, because we work with the IFC and Goldman Sachs on the 10,000 Women Initiative. Uh, we have a great program in Brazil now, 215 million, which we're actually going to, uh, and this is a bit bigger, what Ivanka was describing. So this is small companies that want to become bigger. And there's also the network and marketing, and, and, and here the IFC and Goldman Sachs are participating, and Goldman gives us a small subsidy. You could give us a bit more, maybe? Uh, uh, discuss that. Uh, Ivanka, um, um, same kinds of questions. What, what, what do you think uh, the next stage of this is? You've been to a lot of uh, 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 countries. Any observations from that? Thank you, David, and, and I'll just quickly follow up on, on what Anna was saying about the importance of role models and girls having inspiration and aspiration, and that is achieved through confidence. And so, so this, is, this is a critical um, circle, but, but today, hopefully, there are two women in space who in, will inspire millions of millions of women and girls and boys and men um, around the world because today NASA had the first ever all-female spacewalk. So it was amazing. These are extraordinary women, um, extraordinary leaders in STEM, and up next, we'll have a woman on the moon. So it's very exciting. But, but I think going back to, to the question about what more needs to be done, well, I think we've talked about a bunch of the issues. We talked about access to, to capital and credit. We talked about leveling the playing field from a legal perspective so women can fully and freely participate in the economy. But then there are critical elements which we have, of course, in our own hemisphere. And by the way, there is um, a gender credit deficit in the United States as well as the Western Hemisphere, very much as well. I was just in uh, Latin America and did a three-country tour where we launched with OPEC and private sector partners a $1 billion fund to help women in our hemisphere access credit. So we're quite excited about, um, about that WGDP launch. But women do the vast majority of unpaid care for our children and our adult dependents. Here in the United States, women are the primary breadwinners in 40% of American homes, make up 47% of the American workforce, yet are predominantly responsible for the care of their families. So that creates tremendous challenge in balancing those competing demands and creates really unique barriers that they, these shouldn't be women's problems, they're, and they aren't, they're family problems, but they disproportionately are borne on the shoulders of women. So we've been taking um, a very methodical approach to um, addressing the challenges around access to high quality, affordable childcare in this country, expanding block grants, uh, the largest expansion in 
the program's history of money that's being block granted to the states to offset the cost of care, ensuring that women entrepreneurs domestically have access to capital um, through SBA and increasing loans to women entrepreneurs and, and minority entrepreneurs, which have many of the same challenges in terms of accessing credit, and thinking about policies that enable American families to thrive, just generally speaking. So I, this is not a problem that is relegated to one corner of the world. This is a problem that we're all dealing with in unique ways. And, and that is why, to really get at this, we need to have convenings like this. Because the, the answers will percolate from a regional, from a local level. And then those can be built upon and amplified. So engaging with NGOs in each of the countries in which we're involved and having them really lead the way is going to be absolutely critical to success, as well as ensuring the excitement and commitment of the private sector. What Goldman Sachs did with 10,000 women is, is just phenomenal. And Dina Powell, who I think I may have seen sitting right there, was one of my early calls when I first um, uh, when the president was was first elected, to think how can we do something like that on on a larger scale and leveraging the resources of of the government, and is just a tremendous champion for women around the globe. So hi, Dina. F fabulous. Um, last, uh, we're, I, they, they're telling me five minutes. So David and Anna, uh, fi f final thoughts or next thoughts to projects that you want us to tackle? I, I, I would just say, and it, it, it follows on what Ivanka has said, there's, there's, there's public sector effort that the private sector can continue to do a lot. I think we all can use our platforms more effectively on a local micro basis and on a big picture basis. We saw one of the issues here in the United States with respect to capital allocation for women who are looking for venture capital, who are looking for access to capital. We created a program called Launch with GS just a year ago and allocated $500 million to it to get capital here in the United States to women in the venture business and people that were trying to get female-founded, female-funded businesses started. It's just one example, but we all have great platforms I'd really encourage people in the private sector to take advantage of their platforms, see what they can do, partner with the public sector, and try to make a difference. So, so Every it, little it was bit called, else. again, Launch with GS. That stood for? I'm sorry? Th that, what's the program called? Launch with GS. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> uh, b b b b aptly named Anna. So I, I fully agree. This is not just an issue of developing countries. We actually, in the US, just launched through our regional bank here a, a program a year ago to help business entrepreneurs. We founded 50 businesses across, uh, actually, Boston, New York, to start or grow their businesses. So it's clearly something that needs to be done much more of everywhere. Um, I think it's very important to, to actually make public commitments, because then we're going to have to deliver. So I think every company should make public commitments. Everyone, you know, whatever they can do, taking advantage of, of their footprint, their platform. And I do think collaboration, not just public and private, but also among private entities. Uh, as I said, you know, Goldman is, yeah. as we have done, yes. By the way, Dina, the 10,000 women, in, I was running Santander UK, and we actually uh, collaborated in this in a very productive way, helping small companies become bigger. Because that's where the most of the jobs are created, by the way. The jobs, most jobs in most economies are created when small companies become medium, and it's not easy to scale. Uh, and the program we put in place there with Goldman and other partners allowed us to fund 500 million of, of, uh, of medium-sized companies. So I think collaboration and making public commitments that we can then track. I think that is very, very important. And that would be very helpful. That's super. I, that, that is important. I want to uh, finish with your comment about confidence, confidence for girls and women. But uh, and what I'm what I'm also working on is confidence for countries. One of the things is if they've uh, been behind for a while, uh, that there's got to be the idea that with better policies, with more women empowered and included in their economies, with uh, uh, more opportunities that they can advance. And we do see countries doing that. So these are all, all uh, critical aspects of getting ahead. And we start with a rule of law that really works for individual countries. 
No, I yes, just wanted please. to say one last thing is that let's not forget that there are still men who rule the world, including the private companies. So we need always the men in the room, and I almost always refuse to go to only women's events because we're all convinced. We need the men because they're the ones that can make things happen. So, and this is super important because that's why our programs are for everybody, but we then try to help especially the women so they, you know, everybody can benefit. But. That's super. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Ivanka and David and uh, Ayanna Botin. Thanks. Can I just ask that we remain seated for just a moment because we're going to invite our Ignite speakers to come up and take a picture with our panelists. Thank you for telling us what's been done. Thank you for telling us what the impact is and looking at the future. And I think Anna reminds us there's a lot of hardware, policy, systemic issues we need to deal with, but there's software as well. And mindset change is important. Thank you all so much. Let's come forward, please, and take a picture. I welcome our Ignite speakers to join the panelists for a group photo. A round of applause, please, for all our speakers this afternoon. Thank you all for joining us and have a great evening. Asante Nisana, thank you.